I don't know how Pete Siegel did it because he had to be on the set at 6 a.m. or whatever, and then he'd work a full day. And then he and I, I'd be waiting for him back at his hotel room, and he'd work till one or two in the morning on what the next couple days worth of shooting was gonna be. It was that catch as catch can. And I honestly have no idea how he did it, but we'd be sitting there just like completely wiped out, and Pete would say, I remember once I was at a gas station, and as I backed the car up, I hooked the, the car door on the, on the pump. You think we could use that somewhere? And that's how, that's how we were throwing it out there. So we started brainstorming, we put it, little index cards down on my, my floor. Funny things that happened to us, you know, and, and he told a story of one time he was driving in his car and he didn't latch the hood properly and it flew up in his face. Okay, good, there's an idea. Put that down. And then on top of it, what was valuable to Pete Siegel at this time is that because I was around these guys all the time, Farley and Spade, it's true. As they talked with each other, you just write it down, write it down and put it straight into the script. I saw Farley do that guy in a little coat, um, just just for a goof on Spade, and uh, so you go, oh, that's going in the movie. Is this your coat? <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> One of the, the great compliments I can give to Bill, uh, especially on this movie, is he was responsible for, among other things, fat guy in a little coat, being sung. In the script, I think it says, fat guy in a little coat, fat guy in a little coat. Well, during David's close-ups, Chris was off camera. Richard, is this your coat? Don't. <laughs> Fat guy in little coat. Fat guy in little coat. <laughs> Help! There's a fat guy in little coat. Take it off, Pinky Dick. I'm serious. And by maybe take five or six, he was kind of getting bored and changing it up. And I hear him off camera at Daly's starting to sing. Good. Don't. <laughs> Fat guy in a little coat. Fat guy in a little coat. I couldn't help but just continue to, you know, howl at what was going on off camera. Off me. He's a fat guy in a little coat. Take it off, dickhead. I'm not kidding. <laughs> this one day we got the dailies back, but we didn't like Chris's T-shirt. It was white and it just was too bright. And we knew we had to go back and, and reshoot it. He says, if you're going to go back and reshoot it, have him sing it this time. I said, OK. And it was what made that scene magical and so memorable. Fat guy in a little coat. Fat guy in a little coat. Take it off, dickhead. I'm serious. Richard, what's happening? Oh. What my associate is trying to say is, hey, <laughs> you looked at me like, <laughs> okay, one more time, keep rolling. And action. I talked with him about, you know, what, what could we do to, to liven this scene up when Chris is trying to sell, you know, uh, brake pads to this guy. And uh, we had come up with the idea of taking two model cars on his desk and going through this story. Um, and that's about all I told Chris. I said, okay, you know, use these and, and, and Except for lighting the car on fire, which our prop person had to know in advance, uh, the rest was pure Chris. Do you remember when Jane Curtin said uh, blue shoes? Yeah. Like, uh, I think yeah. that's funny. Yeah, we're set. Okay, I do. I do. Give okay. it a little bit. Grab my arm Let's a second. See it in I did it. Yeah. Let me let me let me see you grab my arm. See it in okay. Watch this, Pete. No, I just go yeah, like now let's see what happens when you're driving with the other guy's brake pads. <laughs> you're driving along. You're driving along, and all of a sudden the kids are yelling from the back seat. Hey! I can't stop! Oh, help! There's a cliff! Oh, and your family's screaming, Oh my God, we're burning alive! The deer hit, which is one of the, you know, the most memorable scenes in the movie, was an idea that uh, Fred pitched to me at dinner. I remember at uh, the Ivy on Robertson, and, and Lauren was there, and he said, Pete, um, Fred has an idea. Uh, Fred, tell it. Um, it. It's quite good. But he told me the story, uh, and it's based on an actual 911 phone call. And so he said, OK, well, we'll make it the PG-13 version, and the rest is history. Unfortunately, because our schedule shifted, 
um, we were now trying to shoot with the deer during its mating season. And, um, and no matter what we did to try and cajole the deer to do this or that, it pretty much had only one thing on its mind. So for example, when we had to shoot the scene of the deer crossing the road and we were shooting between its legs at uh, the oncoming car that had Farley and Spade in it, that actually wasn't a deer. We couldn't get a deer to cooperate. So I had found a, uh, I found a goat that was interested in show business. And we wound up sort of taping up its stomach and spray painting its legs and the bottom of the stomach so it would look, uh, look deer-like, and we were able to get the goat to walk back and forth through the frame. Apparently, as I found out, you can't train a deer. So, uh, you know, I had drawn these elaborate storyboards, uh, the deer waking up and goring, you know, the seat with its horns and coming up out of the roof and standing on the car and running away, and our first animal trainer <laughs> just looked at me, mm -mm. you know, maybe we'll get you the last shot just standing on and running away. I go, I said, okay, let, let's try it then. All right, here's what we're gonna need. You're gonna need to give us a car. We're gonna need to put her in a field and let the deer have her for a month and put food on the car so the deer can eat and poop on the car and smell itself and be comfortable enough to go. Now, you hide your cameras in the bushes. Now at the right time, maybe four or five weeks into it, we'll capture the little critter pooping, lights will come on, and you'll get your shot of it being startled and running away. I thought, are you crazy? This is what we have to do for one shot? And that's what we had to do. We had, you know, this animatronic deer that we had spent for our movie a lot of money on. Here's what we got. <laughs> I thought, this is horrible. This can't work. And so we started playing around with that and reshooting and reshooting and reshooting. Finally, we took the deer skin off of the armature, and one of the guys on the crew just got underneath it and just started doing this, you know, literally under the deer skin. And then that's how we got it. So for every moment of that sequence was fraught with difficulty, but no animals were injured. The changing the clothes in the bathroom on the airplane was one of the few scenes from the original script which went completely untouched. When I read the original story, uh, I knew that scene alone was worth making the movie. Pete said to me at one point, he said, you know, tomorrow we're gonna do the scene in the, uh, in the aircraft. He says, and the, the production designer says, you, you, uh, you're not gonna be able to shoot that. It seems that the producer, or maybe Pete, had, had him design the bathroom too small, they thought, and they never thought we could pull it off. But we did, it was funny. I that up. Well, the cow tipping thing came up. Uh, I, I was sitting in the first meeting with Lorne and the writers, and I said, we should have a scene where we go cow tipping. What you do is you put your shoulder into her and you push. And they fall over. <laughs> they thought that was hilarious. I don't think they thought it was serious. They researched it, found out that's what people do, and so the cow tipping scene went in the movie. So that's that's my contribution to the uh, script of Tommy Boy. Stay between the udder and the hock is a 32 belly option on two on two. We shot the cow tipping scene out in this very remote part of uh, Canada. It was about 10 degrees below zero. There was snow on the ground you couldn't quite see. And uh, we had shot Chris and Rob Lowe you know, running with the cattle, the stampede, and the last thing we had of the night, or quickly becoming morning, was Chris getting his head stepped on by the fake cow leg. And action. We ended up doing about, I don't know, 400,000 takes, and poor Chris is sticking his face into the freezing cold 
coagulating mud as the sun is coming up and the roosters are crowing. And, you know, I just kept saying, again, again, again. And I think we had it on take three. Shut up! <laughs> One of the best memories I have of uh, just fixing something on the day, thanks again to working with Fred Wolf, is uh, when we were at the gas station. Uh, Pete called me in the, in the uh, hotel room once. He said, I need a scene at this gas station with Rob Lowe. Uh, can you think of anything funny, anything funny? And I had seen Farley do crazy dances. So I said, what about Maniac, doing Maniac and squirting with water and have him do some crazy dance? Now that's not funny on its own, but then Farley makes it hilarious. I'm a maniac, maniac on the floor, and I'm dancing like I never danced before. Do, 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 It was brilliant. The whole idea of hosing him off and that just became, you know, one of my favorite moments. And again, it was one of those things where I would get a call from Bill Kerr from the edit suite the next day, and he was howling, saying that wasn't in the script. And we, we started to hear that a lot, that that wasn't in the script, and we'd make it up on the day, and that was one of my favorite Hail Marys. Did you eat a lot of paint chips when you were a kid? <laughs> Why? He was good enough for like, I would call and say, hey, what if we do, we turn on Carpenter's song? Because I have a Carpenter CD in my house. And when I would play it and people would come over, or if it was on in the car, I'd go, what's this stupid station on? Whose stupid CD is this? I want some rock and roll in here right now. And even though it was mine. And Fred like throws that in verbatim. Talk about lame. <laughs> totally. You can change it if you want. I don't care, it's up to you. I can live with it if you can. Suit yourself. He's like, perfect, let's do it. And I've rarely been in a situation where it's that loose. Don't you remember you told me you love me, baby? As long as it didn't mess with the scene and the set and where you had to move the cameras too much, we could try to get away with just no, no, no. internally within what we were doing, okay. uh, move the scene along, but add jokes. <laughs> it's a clip, huh? Hi, <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> Even little things like that that aren't really joke jokes were woven throughout. I think that's what people appreciate about it, that it's not the typical stupid jokes. It was a different version of new stupid jokes. We just killed Bambi. I'm out here getting my ass kicked, and every time I drive down the road, I want to jerk the wheel into a goddamn bridge in Buntman. Hold me in touch. <laughs>